maybe I'm not very human. All I ever wanted to do was to paint sunlight on the side of a house. Artist Edward Hopper. This is The Artful Painter. Art lessons for artists, collectors, and people who love art. Michael Chamberlain says that if Vincent Van Gogh were alive today, he would be a vlogger on YouTube. Van Gogh was a prolific letter writer to an audience of one, his brother Theo. However, as a vlogger on YouTube, Van Gogh's message would likely reach hundreds of thousands of fans. As a 21st century California-based impressionist, Michael inspires an audience on YouTube of well over 160,000 subscribers. In his videos, he tries to show the mistakes that he makes, and he candidly admits that none of the paintings in his videos are gallery-ready. However, upon returning to his home studio, he tenaciously works out whatever problems they may have until they are indeed ready to hang in a gallery. Now, you know that old adage, you can't teach an old dog new tricks? Well, Michael says that isn't true. He says an old dog has more time and experiences that can make us better students of painting. The key to learning is coming to grips with the rate of failure. Failure is a necessary part of the process. When first starting out learning to paint, it's all too easy to believe in the myth of the genius. Michael admonishes that we can't allow ourselves to buy into the illusion that professional artists turn out one great painting after another. Indeed, there are many failures in between all the good ones. Michael says that the difference between a good painter and a great painter is the ability to say, I'm going to figure this out and I'm going to be tenacious about solving these problems. And that is exactly what he strives to do. Michael Chamberlain is tenaciously foraging his own way. My name is Carl Olson, and this is The Artful Painter. Well, you know, it's uh, it's it's astonishing how prescient uh, Edward Hopper was with his paintings. It seems like we're, to some extent, living in his paintings right now. It's it's really strange times. That's true, actually. Yeah, it does seem very. I mean, yes, his his paintings have that feeling of quiet and and sort of uh, look of desolation, and that's yeah, that's something we're definitely seeing right now. How's um, it How's it affecting you there? Where well, first of all, uh, where are you? You're in you're in the San Francisco area, right? Yeah, so I'm just south of San Francisco by about ten or fifteen minutes. Okay. So I mean, yeah, in a suburb, just on the you know on the uh, peninsula, San Francisco Peninsula. I've noticed like over the weekend, it was pretty crowded because the weather was good. So there was a lot of people at uh, Pacific Estate Beach and apparently Ocean Beach in San Francisco. A lot of people outside. But it seems like everyone was kind of keeping a safe distance. So they were being responsible, it seemed like. Uh, for the most part, then when the weather cooled down, I believe it was on Monday, you know, the streets were empty and it was just back to being very quiet. So it's kind of, yeah, it's which is really unusual, which, you know, I'm sure it's, it's that way every, everywhere across the country. But but yeah, when that sun when that sun comes out, though, it seems like <laughs> it seems like people can't resist, you know. Yeah, it's hard. It goes against our, our nature. We want to be outside and we want to connect. But uh, yeah, what, what are you what are you going to do? Right. I I've never seen times like this. I've never lived through anything like this, but uh, doing my part to try not to to spread this. One of the side effects of this was uh, I got selected for the first time into a juried show at the uh, Booth Museum. <laughs> and I don't know that oh, it's okay. actually going to happen. <laughs> so so yes. it's kind of bittersweet. You know, I, I'm excited. To, you know, it, on one hand, life seems to go on. And on the other hand, it's like, oh, what a missed opportunity. But, hey, it, we have our lives. Right. So well, I feel. Yes, absolutely. I feel for the um, galleries. I, In fact, I, I show at a gallery in San Francisco. Um, studio gallery. And, you know, I, so I talked to Jen, the gallery owner and, and, you know, she was just kind of filling me in on what was going on and, and the show, obviously there's going to be no receptions for the current show that just opened and then just kind of what her plans are for the rest of the year. And what they're going to do is kind of shorten all of the shows by a little bit. Um, 
So in other words, you know, there'll be whatever the period of time is where they're closed. Um, they're still going to be doing online, online sales, but, but the shows may be compressed throughout the rest of the year. So that, and then they might combine uh, a few shows. So the point is they're getting very creative about how they're, you know, going to uh, finish off the year. So it'll be interesting to see how that goes. But but I, I would feel for anyone who is like just has a show that's opening up right now and then and then the reception is canceled. Um, I know in my case, you know, a lot of the sales happen just before the show starts. Right. But yeah. So so in other words, it goes online, like, say, three days before the show starts. And the majority of the sales actually take place online. And then, but then there are, we do a couple events, like we'll do, you know, a reception at the very beginning of the show. And then somewhere in the middle, I'll do an artist talk. And, you know, that brings people into the gallery and that ends up selling probably, you know, a quarter of the sales are through those events. So, um, yeah, I just would feel, and plus too, it's sad if somebody works really hard, you know, I know in my case, it's a whole year's work and then all this preparation and then the show goes up and there's no reception. There's no, and then potentially no sales. Oh my God, that would be terrible. So, but fortunately they're getting creative about making sure everybody gets covered and, and gets a chance. So we'll see how that goes. Yeah. Well, it's, it's good that they're being creative like that. I like that idea. Are they, are their doors open at all or, or are they closed and, or is it appointment only? I think it's appointment only at this point, at, at this point. The other thing that I think is good about uh, Studio Gallery in particular, and they're writing, they're in San Francisco between Polk and Van Ness on Pacific. So they're kind of, you know, they're right in the in the heart of uh, the Russian Hill, I guess you'd call it. Or oh, Polk nice. Gulch or something like that. Yeah. So it's a really nice area, but, you know, densely populated. Um, but they have a really great community. Um, you know, I, I when I'm in the city, I go and I sit down with Janet the Gallery. I always catch up with her and. And there's just a nonstop flow of people from the neighborhood who just come in to say hello, whether they're art collectors or not. So there's a very strong community connection with that gallery. And so I think that even if they close their doors, you know, there are going to be people that are checking online and, and, and possibly even purchasing um, from the shows that don't have receptions or whatever, because I think they have developed that strong relationship in the community. So I think that's a really positive thing. I think that's that's beautiful that they've done that. Absolutely. Absolutely. I think another really valuable thing that that this particular gallery did that I that I don't see many other galleries uh, doing. They have several group shows a year where it's an open call to anyone in the San Francisco Bay Area because they do sort of, you know, represent local art. But that that means there's a pretty wide it's probably like 50 mile radius or something like that. But the point is, is that what they do is they open these shows to like a group call type thing, which is a lot of administrative work for the gallery itself. But there's a couple advantages to that. Number one, they have they have like a show. The biggest group show is called Tiny at the end of the year. It's like November through the end of the year. It's small pieces under seven by seven inches framed and they have to be under $500. So this is an opportunity for a lot of beginning artists to submit their work. And they'll typically, they can have 200 artists in that show. Now, the great thing about that is when, and they have two receptions. And so these, these receptions bring in all the artists and their friends. And it's just a great way to bring more people to the gallery. It's giving, it's also giving uh, beginning artists an opportunity to show their work and it gives the gallery an opportunity to find new painters that they may want to include in other shows or work with in the future. So that's been a really, now it's a lot of work for the gallery. But the payoff is so good. Uh, that, that sounds awesome. Oh, it's, it's huge. Yeah. Yeah. And, and the thing that, so for example, for me, people ask how I got my start, you know, like a lot of people who are painters want to know, how can I get into a gallery? And I think one of the mistakes a lot of artists make is they feel like if I get into a really, if I get into a prestige gallery, um, and there's a bunch of those in San Francisco over on like say Sutter Street, Post Street, around Union Square. And if you're a beginning artist and you don't know better, you might think, oh, I wanna get into one of those, that's gonna make me or whatever. But the reality is when I started with Studio Gallery, they were literally this 
tiny little shop on Polk Street. And I was a beginning painter and I kind of questioned myself. I was like, I need to be in a bigger gallery. But they liked my work and they were interested in showing uh, in showing it. And I participated in a little group show. I didn't sell anything. But what ended up happening, that was 12 years ago or 13 years ago, something like that. Yeah, 13 years ago. Wow. So what ended up happening was I didn't, you know, I just took that opportunity because it was the only one that was available to me. But it became clear to me over time, we've grown up together. So now they've got, they bought a space in a beautiful building. It's gorgeous. It's a big, uh, it's, it, you know, now they are one of the prestige galleries in a sense in San Francisco. And I would say one of the most successful. So they started out in a little shop, moved to a little bit bigger shop across the street. This was on Polk Street and then ended up getting this place on Pacific. That's just beautiful. So my thing is, I always say, hey, look, you know, don't worry about getting into some fancy gallery. Just show anywhere. Like if somebody's willing to show your work, you know, and, they're, and, they're, and you like the people and whatever, you never know. This is a long process. Get your work on the walls, participate, and you have no idea what the future is going to bring. So that's kind of what I encourage. And I still do that. Like I, I work with people that I, who I like. And I feel like I have a good relationship with um, both business and even personal. So that's kind of how I've approached the gallery situation. I think that's awesome. It, it's like you both kind of bootstrapped from the beginning and, and grew, to, like you said, you grew together. That's an incredible story. I think it's a good lesson. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and I, th I think it's important to show, uh, you know, starting in your local uh, communities, that's uh, you're far, far ahead of where I am. I'm just I've only been seriously painting in the last two and a half years. And so I'm going through the growing process, the learning process. I started with my local uh, cultural arts centers and, and, and that sort of thing. And that's been a lot of fun and, uh, uh, to do that. And it has resulted in cells, which, you know, they're modest, but kind of gives you a little, you know, a, a pep in your walk <laughs> to, that somebody in your local community said, I like that painting. I want it. <laughs> so Absolutely. Well, there's another, there's another advantage to doing those small shows that I, I don't think people realize either. And I did a bunch of community shows when, when I was at a point where I felt like I had quite a bit of experience and I had a fair amount of online sales and I did some shows that were, you know, people would ask if I would do, uh, there was a couple in like sort of community centers and one was in a church. I just had a policy of just participating in everything that anyone asked me to do. I thought I'm going to put it out there. You never know what's going to, what's going to happen. Now, the advantage was that before I got my solo show at Studio Gallery, I had done, I think, two or three solo shows in community centers. Now, the process of preparing a show for the community centers, it was a lot of work. You know, in other words, touching up everything, signing, varnishing, framing, getting the titles together, all of that work. It was invaluable experience when it came to having a solo show in a real gallery. So it wasn't like, so when, you know, Studio Gallery approached me about doing a solo show. Yeah, I had three, I think it was three solo shows. Now, albeit small, obviously, and, right. and I, didn't, I didn't have any sales. <laughs> I think I sold maybe two or three paintings in each of those little community related shows. But that's a start. But it, no, no, it was great. But the, but the experience of preparing yet still overwhelming. It was a definite step up to go to, to, to have that, to prepare, prepare for the studio gallery show or, you know, a full gallery show. But I would have been, you know, it just was all, that was really helpful to have that experience and have gone through the process. So it wasn't just like all of a sudden I would have been overwhelmed if I hadn't had those community, uh, you know, show experiences, I would have been overwhelmed. And I don't think I would have been as prepared to to make the most of that opportunity at a real gallery. Yeah. You, you said you're a, you are a musician. So no doubt when you you started playing gigs, it's the same way. You start small and you have to learn the logistics of setting up in a venue and playing and, and what it's like to to uh, perform in front of an audience. It, it just takes practice. Absolutely. Absolutely does. Yeah, it takes practice and it takes patience as well, which I think I didn't have as much of when I was younger, you know, when I was a musician. But but later, you know, I started painting at 38. And so, yeah, in 2003. So I had a 
I was just more, you know, I had more life experience and, and I didn't start out with that goal of, you know, trying to be <laughs> a success like I did with music, you know, when you're young and you, you're, you're looking at, oh, do I have some sort of conventional job or can I be a musician? I was very motivated to succeed. Whereas with art, it was something where I wanted to enjoy the process and be happy with what I was doing. And then if I made money with it, that was, you know, a, a secondary benefit. Very nice. Did you always have a desire to create art? Well, I, I would say that I was always a creative person uh, for sure. Like I, I have that. But as far as art, I drew, I like to draw as a kid, but I, I think I was more of a crafty kid. Like I used to like to build things out of like found objects. And I don't mean found objects on the street. I mean like found around the house. Like yeah. I would build little, like, you know, out of toothpicks, build little houses out of toothpicks. Or <clears throat> I went through a phase where I was, I would just buy blank balsa wood and I'd build little boats or little whatever. So I, I was, uh, you know, I liked working with wood and you know, so there's a lot of creative things that I did. Oh, and then at one point, even when I was older, I started building, you know, train models like, you know, uh, what is it? Engage, I believe, oh, like yeah, full, yeah. full on landscape, the whole deal. You know, so so I was always at some point I decided when I started painting, I said, all right, I got to be focused on this. And if you're doing other things like building things out of wood or whatever, it ends up cluttering up your environment. Whereas paintings, that's why I paint on panels. You can create a ton and you can actually store them quite effectively. <laughs> and also too, with paintings, there's a chance of selling them and putting them out in the world. But if you're making train uh, layouts, you know, you're going to be quickly over, your environment's going to become quickly overwhelmed. Yeah, I, I doubt I would have the approval here at my home to do that. <laughs> right, right, right. Well, the other thing too about it is it's such a commitment. Like I love the fact, you know, with, with painting, it's just you're always on to this new discovery, this new, you know, whereas something big like that, you're, you know, you're working on the same landscape or the same environment for for a long time. And, but But the process is what I love. I think that's the thing that's kept me creative my whole life is that I really enjoy just getting lost in some kind of in that creative uh, mindset. I get the same thing writing songs too. it's it, you can you get lost in that process of creation. And I think that's what keeps me coming back is that is that state of mind. So when you say the process, are you talking also about the process of learning or the process and the process of painting itself? Well, I would say it's it's the process. I would say it's the mindset when you're in that zone of like, say, if I'm out painting, I'm in that state where and, and you could probably relate to this, where you're just completely consumed. You know, everything else disappears. You know, it's like whether I'm songwriting or painting or whatever, when you're in that creative zone, everything disappears. It's you're just focused on that uh, in the act of creation. And, and so, and basically what that really is, is just, it's kind of this thing of trial and error, putting a dab of paint down, stepping back, whatever, adjusting the color, deciding where something goes. It's such a completely, it sort of takes over your whole, you know, your whole thought process. That's all you think about. And I think that's a really nice, it's a nice thing to just get away from everything else and to focus so completely on something like that. And I feel like that's what the creative process does for me. It's just sort of a, a vacation from all the other things that you may be thinking about or worrying about. I call it my Prozac. I, I, I hope no one takes offense at that, but it just, it just, it, it just really, it, it puts me in a zone like, like you're describing there. That's just free from worry and anxiety and, and uh, other things, you know, it's just, it's, it's, it's a lot of fun just to be there. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, I think I think that if you think of, you know, say modern humans, modern humans are what, 100,000 years old, maybe maybe more. So the, the, this the, we didn't start creating to have gallery shows. You know what I'm saying? I think that there's something about and, and you think we have problems now. Can you imagine <laughs> what it was like? Could you imagine what it was like 50,000 years ago? Like, OK, 
you know, so I think there was a lot of, I think if you, anyone was going to need a break, you know, something that they could, uh, you know, if you needed a break from reality, I bet you needed it 50,000 years ago. So I think there is something about that, which you mentioned with the Prozac. There's something about that that probably inspired humans to create. It is that, that, you know, the ability to lose yourself in this process and get away from, you know, the present time. So I, I think that that has a big part. It's a big part of why people began creating, I think, is the process, just enjoying the process and the break that it gives you. a definitive moment or uh, event where it it just it sensed it for you said this is it this is what it's all about i would say i mean so for me i did a painting the first painting i did uh yeah it was august of 2003 38 years old and i just wanted to have some work for my house i think we went out and we looked at a gallery and i just remember finally finding a piece that i liked and it was an early California piece and it was like $20,000 and it was really small too. It was like probably a 14 by 18. And I was like, wow, that's crazy. <laughs> and I didn't know anything about art necessarily or the art world really, but being a do it yourself kind of person, I just went out and I got some paints and stuff at Michael's like canvas and whatever. And I brought it home and I gave it a try. And although there were like, I felt like there were some good things happening. I, it was a lot harder than I thought. And it was, and I was like, and I, it just inspired me to want to do another one, but better. And I think that I realized, so in other words, I realized right away that this was something that I felt like I could do if I stuck with it. And it, it was strangely addictive for me. So that happened right off the bat right off the bat. So it was kind of, yeah, after doing the first painting, I kind of knew it was something that I wanted to pursue and keep going with, uh, which I have to say kind of surprised me. I don't, I don't, I would never have, even though I was fascinated, you know, with art and paintings, um, to a certain extent, I, I would never have thought of myself becoming a painter, probably even a few years before that, like say at 35, I probably would not have yeah. It so it was completely novel then. Yes. It was kind of out of the blue. And, um, but I do remember having a, I remember having a discussion with my dad and his wife just before this, like probably six months or a year before where, and I'm always thinking about random things. And I, I just was having this thought. I was like, you know, life is relatively short and you have no idea the things you can do that you just haven't discovered yet. And they took the position that, you no, know, I think if you're a certain age, by that certain age, you're going to, you know, you'll figure out, you're going to find it, you're going to figure out if you've got things that are your talents or your, or whatever. And I said, yeah, that's just impossible. I said, there's probably people out there that are walking around that would be brilliant guitar players that just don't know it because they haven't actually tried. Um, and then when I did start painting, I do remember, um, you know, feeling like self-conscious about it to a certain extent, like, you know, I'm 38 years old. I don't have any artistic background. Is this a waste of my time? Like, you know, I should be serious um, and um, focusing more on my career and things like that. <laughs> but the point, the point I want to make about it is, is that the thing that I've learned through this process is that old dogs can learn new tricks. In fact, I think they can learn faster than young dogs. The thing they don't have that young dogs have is time. So you have to, you have to set aside the time. If you put in the time, you can grow just as fast. I would argue faster than somebody who is possibly younger. Um, because in some ways, like in my case, I felt like I had maybe more discipline and more focus and I had self-educated with music and other things. So I had life experience that I think was really beneficial in the learning process um, when I learned how to paint. 
But my point is, is there, I think that there are those things that you just don't know about yourself that if you, if you give it a try and you stick with it, you'd be amazed at what you can accomplish. I agree. Um, I agree totally with that. I, I, you know, our, our stories are not necessarily the same, but I didn't come into it until much later in life. I didn't even know I had an interest in it. The only difference was, is the first painting that I did was so bad. <laughs> It was, it was so bad. I wondered, will I do another one? <laughs> but I did, you know, I just said, okay, uh, I'll do another. But you know, my wife kept that painting. And uh, the nice thing about keeping it is it now tells me how far I've come. Uh, and now yeah. I'll never, I'll never throw that painting away because it, it is so bad. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, no, I know. And that's, that's the thing. And it is good to, it is good to save those. And, you know, I, I think, well, I don't know, well, hopefully you had a few, you must have had after that, you must have seen a few that gave you a, like some sort of hope, I would imagine. Yeah, right? I, yeah. I did. I did. And that's what kept me going. And having a realistic view that, uh, you know, you, you're not going to become an expert overnight. I just, I, you know, I accepted it. I'm just going to. I want to do this because I love doing it and I'm going to keep doing it and, and I'm going to get better at it. And exactly. uh, that's, that's the way it's worked out. So I I've enjoyed the process of learning. I've enjoyed the process of creating the art. And then I have the problem of once I have the art, I want to move on to something else to pay. <laughs> now yeah. I've got to, got to get rid of all this stuff that I'm painting. So, yeah. Yeah. Well, the, the, there's something also too, that I think is, uh, a misconception that beginning artists have, and I certainly had this, which is the rate of failure. And when you start off, you know, you may have, uh, like say in the first year, you may have like one out of 10 or, or, you know, it could be more than that. Like a couple out of 10, let's like say 20% of your paintings will have some sign of encouragement in them and in your, and the others you may be discouraged by. But what I've learned through the process, and that was very difficult for me because I kept asking myself, am I wasting my time? Like, do I have what it takes? I still believed in that kind of the idea of that an artist has to have a talent, quote unquote. Right. Right. And, yeah. and, and, and so now that I've been painting for whatever it is, I don't even know, 17, I don't know, 17 years, I guess. I feel like talent, you know, whatever gifts you start with, yeah, I mean, it helps a little bit, but you've got you've got so much work ahead of you and you've got nobody is talented in every, uh, you know, it's like you've got drawing, you've got color, you've got composition, you've got vision, you've got there's so many facets that go into making up a good piece of art or a good artist that you can't possibly have all of those things. I mean, if you do great, but most people do not, I would say um, even most accomplished artists have to work on certain um, areas uh, of their, you know, if not all of the areas of, of, of art or creating art. Um, but the thing uh, to return to the idea of failure, that was something that I kind of bought into the idea that if somebody is good or has talent, that they're just knocking out great paintings one after the other. And the reality is that that's not the case, even with really great painters that are currently painting. Um, and that's something I try to show on the videos. Like, for example, when I film everything and most of the paintings that are in my videos are not up to snuff for me when I finish the painting in the video. And at first that was something I was kind of like, do I want to show that as somebody who's a professional artist? Do I want to show the behind the scenes to the point where that's a sort of there's a certain vulnerability there. It's like, okay, look, this is the process. Like when it's finished right now, it might not be where I want it to be. And I don't even say that. I don't even make excuses. I just like, you know, but the truth I'm telling you now is the truth is most of those paintings, like almost none of them are gallery ready. I will live with them for, for like a month or two or whatever. Sometimes even longer than that in, until I can solve all the problems to the, to the point where I feel like, okay, that I liked this, you know, and, and I could frame it up and send it off. But I just felt like that that was something that I would have really benefited from if I heard the truth when I started out, because when you're, when you're starting out, 
you can believe in the myth of the genius and you can really feel like you don't have it. If nobody's telling you that failure is a part of the process, it's a necessary part of the process and that everyone goes through it, even the even painters who have achieved great success, they have had tons of failure and continue to have it. And that is the truth. And so that's why I felt like that was something that I wanted to show. And it hasn't affected my studio sale or my gallery sales, hasn't affected my sales at all. But I felt like by blowing up that myth that it could make me vulnerable in a way that would affect my sales. But then I thought, well, if I'm going to do this, I'm just going to be honest about it and see what happens. And it hasn't. It hasn't affected my sales are better than ever. That's great. One of one, one of my favorite videos that you did recently is uh, critiquing and and problem solving plein air oil paintings. That I was I watched it all the way to the end. So your YouTube metric should be good on that one. Retention. <laughs> <audience>. <laughs> it was good, you know. And I thought, okay, I, I love to see and hear people's thought processes as they do take a painting and make corrections to it and adjustments to it and even be fearless in experimenting. Yes. So. Yes. And also, yeah, I think that the message too there was that, you know, these things are not, you can look at paintings that have failed as, as a learning experience or an opportunity to kind of look, like I said in the video, this painting is just going to sit in a box. So I might as well play with it and see if I can actually solve the problem and learn something from it. I think a lot of times, like early on, what I would do with, with those paintings is I'd either sand them down and paint over them, or I would just like hide them away and not think about it. But now I'm kind of digging back into that box because I'm realizing as an experienced painter, I'm realizing these are like little quizzes, right? These are tests that Ultimately, it's that that final it's solving those final problems that I think takes your painting from being decent to being great. And so, in other words, it's like there's this whole thing about like aircraft. It takes a certain amount of fuel to get uh, an aircraft up to 550 miles an hour. But if you were to push it up to 700 miles an hour, it's going to take exponentially more fuel. Right. Right. Well, I feel like that's how it is with paintings. It takes a certain amount of fuel to get up to, like, say, to have a decent painting. But to get it to be an excellent painting, it takes exponentially more thought and more work. And I think that the difference between a good painter and a great painter is are the people that have the ability to be tireless and say, no, I'm going to figure this out and I'm going to, you know, I'm going to be tenacious about this and I'm going to solve these problems. You know, a lot of people, a lot of plein air people uh, worship at the altar of John Singer Sargent, right? <laughs> yeah. Is there, is there a problem with that? <laughs> no, no, no. Absolutely. Well, the only problem I have is that's another topic we can get into. Yeah. But, but I will say that they should take a note from him. That dude was tenacious. Yes, he, he was. Really, he was just, he would torture his models because he would call them back multiple times. And he was like, and, and I think that's, if anything you're going to take away from him, you can emulate his style all you want. I mean, you should be trying to find your own style, but you can learn from that. But I think the big message from from Sargent is that guy was he was tenacious. He did not. He worked very hard and he did not stop until he got it right. Um, I think that's the big message there. But, yeah, so I think that's that's what I've realized as I've become more experienced is that I need to be to, to do that more. Like oftentimes when I'm out painting on location, I'll get to a certain point and then it starts getting difficult because I have to make those final decisions. And there may be things that are going on that I just can't resolve. Like, I'm not sure exactly what to do. And so in the past, I would just say, all right, that's fine. That, you know, it's good enough. And then pack up and I'd leave. And I didn't do the hard work while I was out there with the subject in front of me. And the problem is, is that when I was starting to prepare for a show, all of those unsolved problems and typically I'll do this show at studio has 40 to 50 paintings. So now I've got to solve 40 or 50 paintings worth of problems. And it's just talk about anxiety. Yikes. <laughs> right. Yeah. So it's like, and then you've got a deadline. So, so what I've learned is I'm going to resolve these things so that when it comes time to prepare for a show, I'm not overwhelmed. And frankly, that, you know, that crunch for a show is not pleasant. And I don't want to spend six weeks out of my year in a, in a place where I'm stressed out and I'm overwhelmed. So, I, so I've become more disciplined about, all right, remember, if you don't solve this now, you're going to have to solve it later. 
So take it as far as you can. Stand there, sit down, walk around, come back, really try to finish it in the first go. And on uh, location. On location. Now, when it's at a certain point and it's blocked in and it's still loose and fresh, proceed with caution because you don't want to kill it. You don't want to overwork it. That's why I say walk away and stand like 15 feet from it and be go and switch your mind into that analytical thing where you're looking at it as a composition and as a painting and you're saying, what bothers me? And even if you could find one little thing, okay, well, this little rock over here bothers me. Go fix that. Then walk back, take your time. And spend, you know, even if you just spend 15 minutes doing that, you're going to have a lot less to deal with later when you're prepping for a show. So now it's to the point where the paintings have, they do need cleanup before a show, but there's a lot less work to do. And now I actually enjoy that process of problem solving. I actually really do enjoy that. If I have the time, I don't enjoy it when I'm crunched. So it's much better to kind of take it on a painting by painting basis. Um, but you know how we are. Humans avoid yeah, procrastinate, yeah, exactly. procrastinate and avoid, <laughs> we avoid the uncomfortable, you know? Yeah. And I, I think a big part of problem solving is a lack of confidence too, because you think like, I don't know what to do. Like, why is this painting not working? I don't even, I don't even know what's wrong with it. I just, I just hate it you know? <laughs> or I just don't like it or it's close, but it's not working and I don't know what to do. That's where you've got to take that time, stand back and just look, just scan it for a little bit and see, like, if you find one thing that bothers you, fix that first. Now stand back, look at it again. Is anything else let your eye wander over? Anything else bother you? Are there any straight lines? Like, you know, a lot of times that'll be a problem. Like you have, you have a mountain, this is a straight line. Or are there any things that are mimicking, mimicking each other? Yeah, I think that's a really valuable thing to do that I do now that I didn't so much when I was first starting out. But it still takes time to and practice to 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 learn that for all those pieces to come together. And and that's where I'm at. I'm I'm slowly coming to grips with that. I'm finding that after each painting session, I have to step away and then I come back and look at it and and rather than just letting problems sit there, I I try to fix it right then and there. Yeah, it's Otherwise, I'll forget it or I'll lose my motivation in, in completing it. So, yeah, absolutely. That's, that's, that's good advice. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think I think that's something that probably as a beginner, I don't know that. Again, I think there was this. Yeah, there was more just focusing on, oh, OK, the painting just was not good. And then I just didn't go anywhere from there. You know, then you just missed a learning opportunity. So. But yeah, it's, it's, I think the people that have, there's a lot of people that, that, you know, just have fun with it and it just depends on what your goals are. But if you want to grow that the mental part is so important. And also too, I talk about how I think it's really important to look at a lot of artwork, a lot of it, just because, and, and look at it, you know, you're a musician too, right? So when I was growing up, like, you know, I don't have any formal training as, you know, I played bass and drums and I played all kinds of different things in bands or whatever. And all of it was just kind of reversed, you know, reverse engineering from records, you know, in other right, words, you yeah. listen to records or tapes and you, your ear, you tr sort of you deconstruct what you're hearing. And that's how most of the people that I've played in bands with, everybody was just self-taught. You just kind of figured it out. And so I think that the same sort of mindset, um, you need to have that same mindset as an artist. So when I look at a painting, I can look at it as a work of art. And then I can also look at it, I can deconstruct it and also look at the components that went into making it up or, or try to see those. And so I think that's a really important thing if you're an artist and you want to grow is look at paintings and instead of just saying, oh, I really like this one, ask yourself those questions like, why do I like this? And what's really working? Or how did the artist go about? Like, what's the composition? And really being analytical about in the process of looking at art and go see art in person too, because a lot of times you'll be surprised by the scale of the work, also by the, the surface texture of the canvas, how much paint's on there. If you've got transparent areas, like where the paint is applied in a transparent way, how much of the underpainting is visible, all of these little details that are just lost on Instagram or online or whatever. So 
Um, that's that's a big part of becoming a, pa- a good painter is just looking at tons and t- just as many paintings as you can and looking at them in an analytical way, kind of reverse engineering w- what went into it. What, what artist are you looking at right now? Well, this this kind of speaks to the whole I can speak about the Sargent thing uh, because uh, I look at so many different artists and often don't even know the names of the painters. Like I'll see people. Yeah, on, I can't even remember their names sometimes. <laughs> exactly. And I'm yeah. not I'm not necessarily interested in any one specific artist. I'm interested in successful paintings that appeal to me. Right. Um, and, and sometimes there'll be artists and that I'll see that they be famous for whatever. And I don't like a lot of their work, but I'll like one of their paintings. Yeah, I don't have any one specific artist. Instagram's a great place for finding lots of different art. Um, and there's lots of great art out there. When I first started painting, it seemed like everybody, all they looked at was Sargent, Soroya, and Zorn. Those are the ones I, for plenty of painters, those are like the the ones that I, I kept hearing about that people wanted to emulate. And then also Richard Schmidt would be a more modern one. Um, but he didn't really fit in as much as those three guys. I kept hearing that over and over again. I was like, oh, I got to look these guys up. But it was hard to find Soroya work. Now, all of them are great painters. Absolutely. But my thing is there are so many great painters. There's so much more beyond the, beyond what they do. And as my taste has sort of evolved, I feel like there's – I would just say, yeah, that's great, but there's so much beyond, there's so much out there. So don't limit yourself, you know, take what you can from those painters, but there's just, and then ultimately you've got to figure out what it is that you want to do. So yeah, if you can pick up a few things from Sargent or from Soroya or, or anybody for that matter, you know, you're going to pick up those things, like I say, kind of reverse engineer what they're doing, kind of add that to your bag of tricks or whatever. See if you can, you know, create those, those effects. Um, And then ultimately over time, you're going to just have something that's all your own. And that's the goal. Uh, So I went through a period of time where, where I just stopped looking at it. I I got to the point where I felt like my skills were good enough that I could just start copying if i was seeing signs of other artists if i felt like my work was starting to look too much like somebody else then i just thought okay i've got to just go out and confront the landscape on my own and just find my own language here and that was something that i did make a a conscious effort to do at one point because i i didn't want to emulate anyone too closely and that's a danger you have like skilled artists people that have a lot of chops they can that's that's a pitfall there. They can emulate people. There's painters out there that do paint like Sargent. Or <laughs> they can become like, they can become yeah. master foragers, right? <laughs> and, well, yeah, in a way, and in a way, that's easy. It's easy because it's already the style's already established. You know, it's like, but who are you? You know, yeah. I think ultimately, in the long run, the, the paintings that are going to be, you know, that are going to be appreciated, you know, a hundred years from now. Not that it matters, but I mean. I think ultimately finding your own style and your own voice is is what it's all about. And if you're if you're too closely em- emulating any one painter, then you haven't done that. I think, again, how I was talking about all painters have different strengths, you know? Yeah. If you happen to be somebody who can't draw, like if you struggle with drawing, well, then your hand is in your artwork already. Your stamp is on it. Okay. You can't avoid it. Somebody who's got like really great uh, draftsmanship skills, you know, you might be able to emulate somebody else. And therefore, you're really not discovering your own voice. Whereas if you're somebody, I feel like Van Gogh is somebody who struggled with drawing and he was just not, and he just was forced to find his own language. And now his paintings are the most expensive paintings on the planet. Right. Right. And he was somebody who had no option. He was not, and he wasn't appreciated obviously at the time. I mean, I think there are a few people that did, but for the most part, his limitations were what created such unique work. 
And I think that's the thing that I like. So there's a lot of paintings that I really appreciate that that are that don't where the drawing is kind of wonky or the color choices are really unusual or you know, I like a lot of work like that because I really do look for individuality. I want to see something that's, you know, where the person has a unique vision. I want to see something. I want to see something of the artist in it. I don't want to see somebody knock off a brilliant sergeant painting. I, that's not, I'm not interested in that personally, but it's safe. You know, like yeah, you, can probably, yeah. you can guarantee if you were to say, like, I know if I could paint as well as sergeant, I would be able to make a living at this. Yes, that's true. That's true. But you, you're pretty much yeah i mean but that's it depends on what you're after you know if you want to sell paintings you know paint like sergeant you'll sell tons of them. <laughs> <laughs> so if you okay, okay. Say, i gotta ask you something mike okay so right. so you started painting you said when you were 38 years old and you just went out and started painting did you take any workshops did you read any books i mean that what gave you the basis to start yeah. So, well, when I, when I first went out, uh, well, I didn't go plein air painting for a while. So what I did was I was first just, I got a music stand and I put the paints on it. I put my canvas on the music stand. That works. Very, very wobbly, but it worked. Yep. And I can't, I think I bought a wax paper palette and I just had yep. like a kit of like a, you know, starter kit of Grumbacher paints quickly went through that tiny tube of white. Right. Yeah. That thing, that thing was gone in a second. But That's anyway, the number one, get a big tube of white. Okay. Got exactly, it. <laughs> exactly. So, so after that first painting of like, like I said, I saw some, I was like, okay, there's some good things going on here, but I need some knowledge. So my daughter um, was very little at the time. She was three, I think. Yeah. Two or three. I used to pick her up from daycare and then I'd take her to those little play area at the library I, we would first go down and I would get some books, like painting books, how-to oil painting books. Uh, this is Burlingame Library here on the peninsula in California. And then there was this play area and she could play. It was so great. It was kind of this fenced-in area with all these toys on the floor. And I, we'd, I, I was loving it because I could interact with her, but I could still, like, I would, could read the book yeah. and let her play with other kids. And so I, we would do that, like, multiple times a week. Um, and it was my way of feeling like I could be working on painting and still spending time with my daughter and she was having fun. So the books that I started off with were these books by a painter. Uh, he's a Gloucester painter named uh, Emile Gruppe. Oh, yes. And yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So I, I remember I read those and even and I liked his style, like his he, see, he was kind of funny and a little bit belligerent the way he wrote. Yep, yep. Like he had attitude <laughs> and I, I love that. So I love those Emile Groupe books and I devoured those. I think there were three in the series. And then, and then I think I picked up Kevin McPherson's book about um, it was something. I, I'm sorry, I can't remember the title. Something about creating light and color in your paintings. Yeah. So what your oil paintings with light and color. Yeah, that was really helpful. So it was a combination of... of you know, books. But then I found it in the library. I found this five part VHS series that was made in the 1980s. And it was this woman who just taught this like painting class. And I wish that I could remember. I, I sat down and I watched that thing over and over again. Like I had to check it out multiple times. You know, you check it out from the library, you get it for three weeks. And then I went through all five video cassettes and then I did it again. And it was purely aimed at the beginner and how to see as a painter. And I'm really lucky that I found those videos because um, I did the exercises and I grew immediately from, from doing those exercises. And it's basically what I talk about and what, what I tell painters to do now when I, when, you know, I give advice to young painters or beginning painters or whatever. And I wish I could remember, I've tried multiple times to find it online. I, I don't, and then I went back to the library and it's long since gone because nobody uses VHS anymore. So Hopefully one of these days I'll figure it out. But basically the idea, you know, the basic idea that she was communicating was that you're going to break down a scene into very simple graphic terms, like just shapes of color. And then you go into those into those shapes and you add definition, maybe one value lighter, one value darker, but you don't want to break up the design. You don't want to break up the overall underlying abstract design of, of shapes. 
And that really worked for me. You know, that really made a lot of sense because prior to that, I just, I didn't know how to structure a painting. I think I just was like, oh, I'm going to paint a pretty scene. And, and oftentimes they wouldn't work. And, and rightfully so. You need shapes. You need like, um, because basically a painting is a mosaic. It's a mosaic of, uh, it's not a drawing. It's a mosaic of shapes. And I find that, you know, if you're dealing with, I don't know, say like five to 10 really strong shapes, the painting is going to be a lot stronger. The, you know, it's going to be, uh, you've got a lot more opportunity for, for success there. And that's, that's seeing as a painter. And that, that's what changed the way I looked at, you know, changed my approach to painting. So I would say, yeah, as far as learning goes, it was books, then that video series. And then I took two workshops by painters, California painters who were successful plein air painters. And I would say that I didn't learn that much. You know, I enjoyed watching their demos. I think I enjoyed that. But I left both of them feel I almost left the second one like a day early because I felt like I felt like, you know what, this is great. And everybody was like kind of exchanging phone numbers and it was kind of a social thing. And that's cool. But I didn't really, I felt like I got to figure it out on my own. You know, I did feel like, yeah, I don't know how helpful this is actually for me. Um, that's not to say that it can't be helpful for people. Well, no, they, I, you, you hit upon something that, that I, I had the same or similar feelings. And this is not to, to put down the, the workshops I took. I enjoyed the workshops immensely. Uh, my first one, I, my approach was, I know nothing about this. I'm going to go ahead and pick one of the best guys out there that I can find that's available within the next, you know, a couple of months. And that happened to be Matt Smith. And, and then later I did another one with him and then another one with Ralph Oberg. And, but here's what I, I learned in doing that was that I didn't want to paint like them. You know, I right. wanted, I right. wanted right. to paint like me. I just needed the fundamentals and then I just stopped taking the workshops. I'd go to demos, but I didn't do workshops anymore. I'm not saying you shouldn't. It's just, I just, I'd almost rather watch somebody and see how they're thinking, <laughs> watch what they're doing and then go home and see if there's something that I can, can apply in the privacy of my own home or in out in the field by myself somewhere where I'm, I can, I can practice and experiment without the pressure of trying to impress a class or, you know, something like that. I just want, I just want to get out there and learn it on my own and, and let it become my own. Absolutely. I think that's, yeah, that's exactly how I felt. I felt like, yeah, I just felt like it was, it, it was interesting. Like I said, like you said, watching the the demos, I find that very helpful. Now, when I was taking those classes, it was maybe around 2005, maybe. So I just started um, so YouTube really wasn't a thing. Now you can watch people do demos. You can find demos online on YouTube and that sort of thing, even by some really experienced painters. I've recently found some by Scott Christensen. I think there was one, um, you know, there's little clips here and there. Oh, Ray Roberts. There's one of Ray Roberts. I think Carmel, Carmel Art Association or something. I apologize. I don't remember the name, but it's something like Carmel Art Association has had some really good plein air painter demos on their YouTube channel. And so I watch Ray Roberts on there. And then also, um, oh, there was another guy, Mike Hernandez, who's a gouache uh, painter. He's a, he's a really good gouache painter, but he's a plein air painter. So it's just fascinating. Like you say, it's really valuable to watch the process and kind of, and kind of um, it can give you ideas of ways of, approach, of approaching your work. Like one thing that I learned a lot from watching demos was the idea of, making sure that within any of my color shapes that I have shifts, you know, I have like a variation of warms and cools. That's, it's very subtle. It's very subtle. It's not, but it's hugely important if you're going for luminosity. Like in other words, in a shadow shape, you know, like say you have like a blue or a purplish shadow shape, put some warm pops of warm, even yellow in there or some warm colors um, so that you're getting that, it, it's going to make that shadow more luminous. So there is that, those are things that I learned just watching other painters online uh, is that is those shifts of, you know, those warm and cool shifts within any, and that's also like in the warm areas, sunlit areas, having some cool little bits of cool in there, like say, you know, in a yellow or warm white area, putting some, a little bit of violet or, or whatever. 
yeah, th- those are things I learned from from watching demos. But like you, I felt like you know, I felt like this is just something I got to get out there and figure out. I got to figure it out for myself. And 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 also, like you said, without the pressure of time, uh, which is usually limited when you're in a workshop. Um, that's something that I felt like people ask me, oh, would you do workshops? I kind of opted to put it out there, for, just like put it out there on YouTube. You give probably more demonstrations than anybody out there on YouTube. You have over 160,000 subscribers. You've had over 5 million views. And I'm one of those guys. I like watching your process. It's kind of like I get to go plein air painting in the comfort of my basement studio. <laughs> and, yes, I, yeah. and I learned something there about that. What What prompted you to start? putting this all out on YouTube? I had been on YouTube for since maybe 2007. And I put some like sort of, I started out with just doing like music video type things, like covers. In 2007, it was kind of in the beginnings. I put out some covers. I remember I did one of Wilco, which is a, you know, kind of Americana band. I did a cover of one of their songs. It got like 20,000 views, which now if I put out a cover of something, I mean, it's like you're lucky to get any views at all because so much music out there. But the point is I was familiar with it. And then my daughter, who is now 18, she's a big YouTuber at this point. She's got 8.5 million subscribers and she's, yeah, things have been kind of crazy. But when we started, like she was starting, wanted to start a channel and I was wanting to start a channel too. Like I was wanting to do something with my art channel, but I didn't know what I wanted to do. This was about, it was about three years ago. And um, I, even though my channel was, my art channel was about seven years old, is seven years old. I did, I would do like occasional little things on there where I talk about a painting, but, and then I'd link it to my website, but I just didn't have any real direction. I was like, I like making videos, I like talking about paintings, but I don't quite know what to do with this. So anyway, so about three years ago, when Emma wanted to start her channel, and I was like, you know what? I'm starting one too. I want to. I want to revamp my art channel. So we started sending each other videos of different creators, um, YouTube creators at, the, at that point. She was mostly sending me like you know beauty related stuff and. And, but I remember one I found, I found Casey and I at that yeah, time. Yeah. And, and I was like, I love this idea of vlogging. Like that's super cool. Like what if a painter actually vlogged their experience? And I was more interested in, in being outdoors, you know, like, cause California is so beautiful and there's a lot of really nice landscape here. And I thought, you know, maybe I'll try to do like painting vlogs. And, and I just got fired up about that idea. There are some logistical issues, obviously, um, about that. But, you know, just tra- deciding on the right camera, the right equipment, dealing with wind, um, also dealing with trying to create a painting and a video at the same time and not have the video process kill my, you know, my creative, my my painting process. Yeah. Uh, it, <laughs> yeah. It, you know, it was like, it was like how, and it did, it took a while because I think my painting suffered because of the video in the beginning. Um, it was just a lot to handle, but I stripped down my gear. I got everything dialed in to the point where it's so natural for me now that I record every, I, I record every time I paint outside, almost every time. It would be such a luxury to just go out and paint sometimes. <laughs> like, I don't know what I do. I'd be like, I, I actually, the other day I went, this happened once in the last year. So I showed up at Pescadero and it was beautiful light. And and I, I turn on my camera and it says, no SD card or oh, no, no card. And I was like, and I was like, you know what? This is good for me. This yeah. is good for me just to see if I can paint and actually enjoy the process. And I did. I enjoyed it. But the point is, there was... It, there was that sort of feeling of, is this going to impact the result of my painting, which I, I depend on for my living because I wasn't making any money. I still don't make, I still don't make any money really from YouTube, very little. But I think what it, what it does is it is an opportunity for me to kind of share what I know. And I like the community. There's a lot of great people that have been showing up in the comments for three years now. And so like it's, it does feel, and a lot of the people, a lot of the relationships that I have via YouTube 
have become real life friendships like Mark James Lucas, who I painted with a couple of times. Uh, he's, he lives in Vancouver, but he always passes through California on a way to like a Mexican painting adventure he does every year. Um, so he always stops and will paint for a couple of days. And then there's uh, Araya Miles, uh, Araya Miles Boyle who lives down in, you know, in Southern California, I painted with him a bunch. You've probably seen him in the videos and there's others as well that have just become really, that have become friends. So I like the community feel of YouTube. And then also I think this year I noticed at the show, there were people that knew about me from YouTube that were buying from my show at studio. So I think ultimately it's getting my name out there uh, as far as sales for paintings go. But for the most part, it's just a really, um, it's a really nice thing to do like the community aspect. And I love painting and I love sharing information and I love seeing people grow and achieve uh, what they're trying to, to with their paintings, to grow with their paintings. So to me, that's what it's all about. That's kind of partly what inspired me too. Like I remember when I was, when, when I first started looking into painting, you know, I, I felt like what was going on in Paris back in the 1800s, you know, with the Impressionists, like they were out on the sand just trying to figure out a new way of like in the case of Monet of like how to paint water. They were fascinated by painting on location and trying to solve these problems. And there was a certain level of, I mean, obviously they argued with each other and whatever, but there was, you know, there was this sort of community of painters that were, that, that were inspiring each other and challenging each other. And that's something that I feel like uh, that I want to kind of, uh, you know, I wanted to be, be a part of, and there's no, cafes in San Francisco where artists are gathering <laughs> and, art and arguing about the way to paint shadows or how to apply, you know, so YouTube is that community. YouTube is that cafe where we, we share ideas. Yeah, and talk, right now, you know this is what we got to do, right? <laughs> this is that, it. Yeah, right now more than ever. Right. Yeah. So, so I try to, that's something that I've tried to include in the videos too. Like it, it can be difficult because when you're in the moment with another painter, you, you know, I want to be present with them. I don't want to just be shoving a camera in their face and, you know, you got to kind of feel that out. But at the same time, there's so much valuable conversation going on. And I, I sort of touched on that a little bit with Mark James Lucas the last time we painted together where we sort of stepped back and start, started looking analytically at, at our work and trying to solve problems right there on location. So hopefully that's something that I will do more of. Uh, in the future. But one thing I'll say is that I, and Araya told me, he confessed, you know, like the first time he was on one of my videos, he's like, I got to do a good painting. I got to do a good painting. <laughs> right. And, yeah. and, and so, and I'm like, dude, don't worry. Nobody cares. Like your paint, it's fine. Right. So there is that as well. Like I want people to feel comfortable. He's totally comfortable now. He doesn't care, but he's been in like four or five videos. Hopefully I'll get a group of people that are comfortable just like, saying, all right, this is not working and uh, here's what we can do. Like, or here's maybe we'll put our heads together and talk about like solutions. I think that can be really valuable um, to have in the videos to show that problem solving or if a painting's not working, you can solve the problems. There, there are ways through it. Oh, I think that, I think that would be awesome. Yeah. Yeah. So hopefully that, that'll happen. I have to be honest. When my daughter's channel blew up, I've been in several of her videos and we had so much fun. Like I would collab with her in some of the videos, but, but because she's got such visibility, it's drawn a lot of young people to my channel, which is great. Some of them are artists or some of them just want to see Emma's dad, you know, but all the young artists that have come to my, my channel that have found me through her, it's been really great because there's not a lot of painting information out there for young painters or young no, artists. A lot, yeah. a lot of the art programs are not, are closed down and, and, or if you're somebody who wants to paint, but you don't have the money to go to an art school, which is tremendously expensive. And so I'm getting email and emails and feed, feedback from young people. And that's what keeps me going too. It's just, they're getting stoked on painting and they can't find that information anywhere else. So I feel like that's a really valuable thing too. I, I think that's, I think that's really good because one of the things I've noticed over the years, well, recent years that, that I've gotten into this, a lot of, a lot of old guys like me get into this thing. But then when I go to the events, I see a lot of other old guys <laughs> Yes, yes. And, and, and I love the exuberance of youth. So I, and I, I would like to see young people take something up like this 
It's like um, got my brother-in-law or my wife's brother-in-law. He's a wood turner. And one of the things he laments is the lack of young people. He says, you know, they'll play a video game, but they don't have anything to show for the video game, even though it's, you know, they may enjoy it at the time. But when somebody turns his magnificent work of art, a, a wood bowl, uh, it's something that they can show and it'll last a lifetime. And I think that's what uh, a lot of young people are missing is having that thing that you could have that you can show and be proud of. Yeah, I agree. I think I've thought that same thing. And there was a period of time where on my iPad, I just got obsessed with uh, a chess app. And I think chess is a brilliant game. I love it. But I was spending a lot of time playing it. And I came to that exact conclusion, like, you know what, this isn't going to really, I mean, it's good exercise for the head, but like, if I spend too much time on this, which I could, I could get way sucked into that. I felt like, you know what, I should be putting this into the challenges of painting and, or something that's going to, you know, produce some kind of a physical result and possibly even some kind of income. You know what I mean? Right. So, so I agree. I think that I feel that way with music too. Time spent like working on guitar or writing music or whatever. It's the same thing. You come out with a product at the end and you also get that mind exercise that you might get from, from a video game. So I, I fully, yeah, I fully agree. to say something else regarding like young people and yeah. plein air painting i think that there was a long time there where um in art school and, and this may still be the case where plein air painting was seen as a nerd activity it was seen as something that was like not avant-garde it was seen as you know i've heard painters like talk about that painters who started out you know in the 80s like the new wave of plein air painting um about how in art school they had, I think Jim, uh, Jim McVicker talks about this. There was no, you, you got none of that in school. Like it was, you know, plein air painting was looked down upon. It was kind of not cool. I think that that, that lasted probably until recently where now you're starting to see some young painters. I just saw, found a painter named Tad Retz. I think his name is T-A-D-R-E-T-Z, Tad Retz. I believe this guy's like in his early 20s. Uh, maybe 22, 23, and he's, you know, doing beautiful plein air paintings, beautiful. And so, and I've had people contacting me also in their early 20s, um, and hopefully I have some of them on the videos that are really interested in plein air painting. So I think that it's something that this new generation of young people, they don't, they, they're, they're not swayed by that you know, that old school attitude that, that it's uncool or that it's not avant-garde. The thing you've got to remember, like painting from life, if you're a representational painter is always the best, you know? So if you're, it's like, there's no substitute for actually standing in front of an object, whether it's a still life or it's a model or whatever, there's just no comparison. You're going to get so much more visual information in front of it. And that's why there's a longstanding tradition of painting from life whenever possible. So that applies to landscapes as well. So I think a lot of these young painters understand that. And so they're, yeah, they're, they're interested. And this generation doesn't seem to be, they think, it, at least the feedback I get is they think it's cool and they want to do it. Well, I'm sure when you go out and paint, do you, uh, they come up to you. They've, I, I know when I go outside and paint, I, I get crowds. People will come up and, and it includes young people. They're fascinated. They're curious about what's going on. I mean, it would be easy as a painter to get irritated with that. But on the flip side, I think it's great that they're curious about this, this, uh, this very analog art that's taking place and they think it's cool. No, I agree. Absolutely. And I, I paint a lot. I'll paint a lot in remote locations, but I do plan there in San Francisco as well. And when I'm painting in this city, 
I more or less have a nonstop flow. People are respectful, but they, they're, they're interested. And I, you know, like a lot of plein air painters are self-conscious about going out the first time, especially if you're like painting on a city street or something like that, which is understandable. I was terrified the first time I went out as well. I identify. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's very vulnerable as you feel like, especially like when you're first starting out because you don't have a lot of experience and your work is probably not going to be, you know, you're not going to be super confident about the results of your work. So it's like, oh God, here I am out in the middle of everybody painting and it looks awful and I'm, you know, whatever. But what I found is, is that, you know, if you've seen my process, I just slop it on in the beginning. I like that. I like the painting to be a mess. And then you just come in and then you, you just do the minimal tighten up to kind of pull it together. And so that you've got this, this, this balance between chaos and order. I think my paintings are a lot more orderly than, than when I see somebody who really piles it on there or really loose, I'm like, oh, my, my paintings feel tight. But the point I'm making is, is there's this balance between, you know, looseness of brushstroke, energy in the brushwork, and then also like tightening it up just enough to kind of firm up the structure. But so, so my point is my paintings, when I'm painting on location, I cannot tell you how many painters or not painters, but people will come up to say hello. And some will just, you know, like walk on by and, and I can just see they're just like, oh, that poor guy, you know, like that's a mess. Like this guy, he's like, what is he doing out here? You know, and I, I, I'm comfortable with that, you know, and they're nice, but you can just see they don't say anything, right? They just look yeah. and they're bewildered because most people do not ever see a painting that's like in, like that's just been scrubbed in. They, they don't understand the process. So they're like, they look at it and they think, wow, what a disaster <laughs> that, you know, and then so I've had people even ask me like, oh, so this is a fun hobby or whatever when I'm in the scrub in stage or it's just roughed in. And I'm like, you know, somehow we'll talk and I'll say, yeah, well, I'm actually this is what I do for a living. I paint for a living. And they're like, really? You're like, really? Like people buy these? <laughs> and uh, so even if you are a skilled painter and you're an experienced painter, until that last 15 minutes of the painting or last 20 minutes of the painting, it's going to look like a disaster that people might not be able to understand anyway. Like, so even if you're experienced, you just realize people aren't going to get it. So who cares, you know, but to, to, to finalize what we were talking about, it still is inspiring for people to see that. And I have people, San Francisco gets people from all over the world. It's a big tourist city. And um, I've had people who don't even speak English want to come up and take pictures with me and, and it's just, I think that everybody, regardless of where you're from or how old you are, what your background is, we all are united in the fact that humans like to create. That's something that we can all be united in. And I think that's, that's, so when you're out painting, you're sort of an ambassador for the arts, you know, you're, you, and who knows, you may inspire somebody to go home and start on their own creative journey. Another great thing about painting in plein air is you're going to inspire people. And I've never, never, I've painted outdoors hundreds of times in crowded places, in remote places. I've never had anyone, every, all the feedback I've gotten is, for, is has been really positive. People who are excited to see somebody out doing something creative, never anything negative, except maybe one time there was somebody who was drunk and they were belligerent. Oh, no. Yeah, but that was <laughs> but that was it. I was out painting by the train tracks, but no, even then they weren't. You know, it wasn't like hostile or anything. But no, like I say, everybody's been really great. You've got to have a great story about something that that happened while you were doing plein air painting that just made you think, "Wow, this is the life." Yes. Well, okay. I had there's a couple of days like that. You know, I mean, I have days like that quite frequently, but. Like there's a couple that really stand out in my mind and, and there's a video, I can't remember what it's called, but it was, it was one of the first times I painted in Laguna beach and Laguna beach has a long history of, it was an art colony and there was a lot of, you know, I think William went was one of the California painters who settled there, but there were a lot of painters there. Um, I didn't know a lot about Laguna beach and I like Southern California kind of, even though I went to college in San Diego, Southern California always kind of scared me in a way just because it's so big. I didn't know my way around. There's freeways everywhere. But my daughter moved down to LA because of her situation with YouTube. And so I would go down and help her move and I'd help her out. And I ended up being down in Southern California quite a bit, got to the point where I was comfortable 
with it kind of thought got my you know learned my way around and so i thought you know i'm gonna go down to laguna and i'm just gonna paint and i hit up Araya. i called him up and i said hey dude are you around and he's like yeah he's, and i said i'm going down to laguna he's like i'm there so we met up in laguna it was a beautiful day and as i'm driving into town i noticed there's like laguna art museum right and i went in and they were having i didn't even know there was a laguna art museum apparently it's a hundred years old and they were having a 100 year anniversary of plein air painting in California. Sweet. And it, I, I, it was like seven bucks and there was like, was lightly attended. And I went in there and I walked around and I'm looking at all these like early California paintings, all these plein air paintings going back to like a hundred years ago. And I was so stoked. I thought it was just so inspiring. And then I walked out to Heisler Park overlooking the ocean and there's some palm trees and stuff. I met Araya, did a painting, and it was just perfect temperature. It was so beautiful. I had a nice conversation and then later ended up selling that painting. It was just a great day. So uh, that was one day where I thought, this is just so nice. But I have a lot of days like that as well uh, when I'm out just painting locally here on the San Mateo County coast um, where it's beautiful. Most of the days where I really feel like I'm living the life, it's when I'm out with another painter friend and maybe I'll go for food afterwards and it just, and talk about art. And so those are the days that I think are the best, but that one day in Laguna was just so perfect. We were like standing on this grass lawn that was perfectly level and it had like shade from some palm trees and there was like a light breeze and the scene was perfect. I was like, this is just, yeah, you know, on the North Coast here, it's rugged, it's cold, it's windy, it's brutal. Southern California painting, I was like, give me some more of this. This is nice. Well, I, I it's been many years since I've been to California. I got to get back out there, check it out. So, uh, I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm here in Georgia, so it's it's very green. All, the only color you need on your palette is is uh, Grumbacher's uh, Thalo green yellow, and I think you got it. <laughs> That's so funny. I wonder, I wonder, I think there's like probably every, it wouldn't be funny if you could pick like each state has its own color. Yeah. Actually, yeah. I think if you were going to paint a, if you were going to pick a color for California, well, it depend on the season, obviously green in the winter, but, but I noticed one time and I don't even use burnt umber, but I remember one time I went out with burnt up umber because I had a tube of it. And I thought, oh, I'll go experiment with this. And I mixed a little white and then a little more white. I'm like, wow, this is like the color of California, the hills, the sand, the, you know, yeah. during, during the dry season, I thought, boy, you don't have to do much to this to, to match most of the colors. Um, and I even used it for a while. But what I ended up finding was that it, it was much more vibrant when I was mixing those colors on my own than when I had a ready made color for the scenery. So I stopped using it. It was like, it was almost like, I didn't have to do much to it. And therefore I just, there seemed to be, the paintings just seemed duller, to be honest with you. It seemed more vibrant when I was mixing those, you know, those sort of neutral colors by myself. So now I just kind of, um, yeah, so I took it off the palette. <laughs> well, you have a rather, um, I, I guess a limited palette would be about the right word. Uh, you, your palette uh, in your videos, you don't have a whole lot of colors on there. Right, right. Well, I think there's there is a tradition in plein air painting in the books I was reading and everything of keeping a very limited palette. The less you deal with out in the field, the better. And then also the books I read said, you know, look, you want to start with a limited palette because you want to start with like a primary color palette so that you can learn how to mix and gray down colors using complements, for example. So that's what I started with, but I started with what's called a split primary. So where I had a warm and cool yellow, I had a warm and cool red, and then I had a warm and cool blue. And that's what I started with. And then later I found that burnt sienna is just an invaluable color. I love the pops of burnt sienna. When you sketch with burnt sienna or if you tone a panel with or a canvas with it to get those little pops of red, are really valuable when painting landscape because, you know, everything is mostly blue and green. So those little pops of red from the underpainting or, you know, or from your initial sketch, I think really, you know, create a lot of vibrancy in your painting. So, uh, and then yellow ochre is just also a really, um, a really handy color. So, um, yeah, two, so that's yeah, kind of, that's kind of what two, good. Uh, yeah. Those are two good uh, modifier colors. Certainly. Yes. 
Now you you have a DIY spirit. I've noticed in watching your videos too. You make your own panels as well. Right. So do you? Right. Yeah. C can you, for the sake of the audience here that haven't seen your videos yet, uh, what do you like to paint on? Well, I think up to the side, up to about sixteen by twenty. Uh, mm -hmm. I like to paint on masonite panels that I prime myself with Utrecht professional grade acrylic gesso. And I'll put three coats on. The first two coats are just, I'll thin it with a little bit of water as per the instructions on the container. And then the third coat, I will put in two tablespoons of 4F pumice into the final, uh, and, and that's like two tablespoons per one cup of gesso, and then I'll thin that with water to make it workable. So those two tablespoons of 4F pumice, which is a very fine, it's, I believe it's a volcanic stone. What I found is when I was just priming with pure acrylic gesso, the, the surface was too slick. There was no absorbency, and you know I would just end up getting like this very streaky look, and I was spending a lot of time trying to fuss over making sure I was getting coverage. So I didn't like the surface. And then I, I can't remember who it was where I heard about adding different things like marble dust or other things to the gesso to give it more texture and more absorbency. Um, but somewhere I heard about mixing pumice and I went to a furniture store uh, or a, a fine woodworking shop in called Woodcraft, which I believe are all over the country. And uh, they had 4F pumice there, I guess, because it's used as, it's like to polish things like wood, you know, you can use it so fine. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. You, you, pumice is something that's used for polishing. I think you can even use it for like with paint jobs or whatever to buff out a paint job to make it really shine. It's not so coarse as you have little bumps in the, in the painting no. that's visible, no. but there, but yet there's enough texture or uh, friction for the uh, paint to s stick? I would say 4F pumice is kind of like flour. So, I mean, we're talking super, super fine. Now, the painter that I first heard talk about it, and I apologize, I can't remember the painter's name. It was somewhere I just saw it in a forum online. And he was talking about putting four tablespoons in per one cup. I did that at first, and I thought, and he was talking about how it would wear down his brushes but that it was worth it. And I did four, uh, four tablespoons the first time. And it was like, man, you could, this is rough. Like this is serious. You could file your fingernails with this thing. <laughs> and, um, that was just too much for me. So then I backed off to three, still too much backed off to two. And then it was just right. So you may have to experiment with how much you put in. I find that that's, that's my, that's the way I like to paint on my panels. Um, I can get, you know, the, a little bit of absorbency when I'm putting on those early transparent colors when I'm scrubbing in. And then there's enough tooth when I go in to lay on the subsequent layers that the paint's just not slipping all over the place, which it is typically with acrylic gesso. Acrylic gesso is fine on canvases because it absorbs in. But on a surface like masonite or hardboard, there, it's such, that's such a dense material that the the gesso is going to just sit on top and create essentially like a plastic film on top of the masonite. And there's no absorbency at all, really, that I, I mean, if there is any, it's so little. Yeah, it is slick. I'm going to have to try this. I haven't tried this myself. I've been looking for the ultimate surface to paint on. Yeah. Well, I saw your video where your, where your son cut out panels for you, right? Yeah, but see, th yeah. that was, that was gesso to board and see, and, and though those work very nicely. <laughs> <laughs> and I've yeah. used them for quite some time. It, it's, it still has that problem that you talk about. So, you know, you can get real streaky with it. I enjoyed it to to an extent, but, you know, it's like anything. You get more experience with it, then you begin to notice the problems. I really need to do a <laughs> follow-up video on that because that, that thing is really out of date. Yeah. So, yeah. Well, I, I will say this. The difference between painting on a panel with pumice and not it's just two tablespoons of material in that final coat i i will not paint on a on a like uh, i can't get the effects i'm after without that pumice in there it's huge it's huge i think a lot of times we might try something and and that you know and then give up on it but remember like you know as far as your materials go whether it's your easel or or your whatever equipment you choose the materials you use to paint with experiment and you got to do problem solving there because your methods 
are going to be different from the next person. So, you know, there's some people that probably paint on gesso panels uh, without any pumice or anything, and they're fine with it. But I find for my process, it just doesn't work at all. It's just, it's not a fun process. It's just, I'm fighting the thing the whole time. Yeah. And, uh, and, and I'm kind of that way with canvases now, like that's, Okay, so I paint on panels up to about 16 by 20, but I'm honestly thinking about just going, trying to get even bigger. Now, with masonite, if you get bigger than that, you get kind of, the material gets kind of wobbly. It's just, it's not. Well, you you gotta, to, you, it's got to be cradled at that point when you. Get, exactly. Yeah. You have to cradle it. Right. And I don't know if there's limitations, like maybe you could do a, a like a four foot by eight foot masonite painting. And if it's properly cradled no problem. You know, you're not going to get any warp or wobble in there. Uh, it's a great surface to paint on, but I do have typically in my shows, I'll have paintings as big as three feet by five feet. Um, always a couple three foot by three foot cityscapes. And there again, I've been using some like centurion, uh, what are they? Centurion linen, uh, stretched linen from, uh, Jerry's and they're affordable. But those are just too absorbent. And I feel like those are just a struggle to paint on. Although I've got some decent paintings out of them. I just feel like if I was painting on a board, because I'm so used to that, the paint goes on fast. And if I'm mixing in the gesso, then or if I'm mixing the gesso myself, then I'm in control of the absorbency. I'm in control of the surface and I can tweak it to exactly how I want it. Whereas if you're buying stuff out of the store, you know, like a stretch canvas that's pre-prepared, you're, you're just going to, if you find a surface that you like, great, but oftentimes those are really expensive. <laughs> and if you're trying to make a living doing this, you have got to get your material costs down. That's what I feel like making panels is it allows me to experiment and to not, the materials aren't so precious that I'm going to be careful. You know, a 16 by 20 might cost me a dollar or two, you know, it's, it doesn't cost me much at all. And so if I go out there and experiment and just go at it, which is how I like to approach a painting, I feel like I'm going to get a better result on a, on a surface that I'm not being precious with. You know, if I've got a $17 canvas, that's going to impede me. That's going to slow. I'm going to be careful. You know, it's just. Well, exactly. Yeah. I, the same, you know, we get a lot of advice that says, you know, paint on the finest materials, uh, you, you know, squeeze out big gobs of paint and stuff like that. But there is some money going out when you do that. And when you're in the learning process, it can be, it can be intimidating uh, to do that. So, yeah, I, uh, you know, I've, I've talked to some artists one material that they're experimenting with, they've had good good success with, is the uh, polyflax by um, by Fredericks. There's a pure polyester uh, polyflax, and it's much much less expensive than uh, linen. But I haven't tried it. I don't know what the what the pattern of the weave and all that is, because that has an that has an impact on the uh, the paint, uh, you know, the finished product as well. You know, the weave of, yes. the, of the of the threads. So. I painted on cotton for many years and now I'm in the process of changing, trying to find that thing that I like. I don't like cotton. The thing I don't like about it is the weaves are so deep that uh, you get these little specular highlights on them and you, and you can never get rid of them unless you just put gobs and gobs and gobs of gesso on it. And by that time you would have been better off just spending the money to get, you know, something else. Right. Right. Well, there's another, there, the way the paint sits on a, on a hard surface, it's like, say, uh, you know, there are people that make plywood panels too, you know, like yeah. a birch or, or whatever, the way the paint sits on say a panel, like a wooden or, or a hardboard panel is very different. As you mentioned from the it way is. the paint, where the way the paint looks on a canvas. Now there are certain effects you can get on canvas that you can't get on panel and vice versa. Some of those I really do like, like I think, but, but for the most part, what I find is, is that the paint that's sitting on a wooden panel uh, or, or a hardboard panel to me seems more vibrant. There's more. I agree with that. Yeah. It's like you could use the same mixes and everything, but something about that fabric texture, it kind of dulls down the cup, co the, the color could have something to do with the absorbency as well. But I, I don't know. I mean, maybe if you're painting super impasto and you're just like frosting your canvas, then obviously it's not going to make a difference. But again, there are certain things that I really do like occasionally. I'll use uh, Blix got like traditional, they're traditional, which is not their premiere, 
but they're traditional stretch canvases, which are really inexpensive. But the surface, I have to say, I really do like it. It's a nice surface for painting. Is that a um, linen or, or canvas? No, that's just, just that's just like acrylic gesso on canvas. Yeah, and it's, okay. it's a it's a super lightweight canvas. So they they probably would say, oh, this is not you know archival or whatever. Uh, I mean, you could you know you could always take it off and just mount it on a board if you wanted to be more archival, but. The point is, it, it, the surfaces are really nice. When it, I've noticed, there's times when I painted things on those, you know, Blick traditional three quarter inch whatever stretch, that I get effects that I can't quite get with uh, with the panels. Primarily in that first coat of having like, you know, a lot of it's just more absorbent. So there's more absorbency, and then when you come over with you know subsequent strokes, the the canvas does. You can get cleaner strokes on top of whatever underpainting you've done. But again, I love painting on panels. I think they look super vibrant and the paint sits up on top of it in a nice way. So um, I think it's just a matter of coming up with your own recipe for making them that, that works for you. The other thing too about it is when you're painting plein air, canvases are, they're a hassle because they get illuminated, they can get backlit very easily. So you've got to bring cardboard to, to cover the back of the canvas. And whereas if you're painting on a panel, it's good to go. You don't have to, you know, and then it's also easier to carry, if, you know, I think the biggest wet panel carrier I found is a 16 by 20 by Raymar, which is what I have. But I want to start painting larger. Like I'd like to go to 18 by 24, I was thinking I would have to make my own wet panel carrier for that. <laughs> so, but hey, I know I went out and painted not that long ago with a guy. He went out to Point Reyes, which is a really remote location up in Marin County, and we're walking down, and I'm like, "What size canvas is that?" And it was a it was a thirty by forty, and he just paints oh. thirty by no, he paints thirty by forties stretch canvas on location with a French easel, like with a full box. And that's all he does, 30 by 40s. And when I saw his, when I saw the 30 by 40 outdoors, it didn't look that big, to be honest with you. And my 16 by 20s when they're outdoors, they look tiny. So it's all just, it's all relative. Plus too, if you're painting a 30 by 40 indoors, you can barely get back far enough to see if it's working. Whereas if you're outdoors painting a 30 yeah, by 40, you can, back 100 you yards, can walk yeah. 100, yeah. <laughs> You could walk, and this guy painted super loose. So I was like, I kept walking back. I got like back, like about 200 feet before it made <laughs> sense to me. <laughs> but, you know, it was like in the first sketch in period. But I was like, but I was like, good for him. Wow. He's, he's really going for it. So if it wasn't so windy uh, around the coast, I would probably paint bigger like that more often. But again, having that that the light come through the canvas is a real problem, that, and, and you don't have that with panels. So I'm trying to figure out a way to just up my panel size out on location. And the thing I do too is I paint on panels like 16 by 20, or hopefully bigger in the future. And then if I want to frame like the ones that work out, then I'll build a cradle for it. So I'll back it with a wood, you know, I'll back it with a wood frame to thicken it out to be three quarters of an inch, and then I can frame it just like a stretch canvas. It's the same exact, you know, measurements, um, but I'm not cradling the ones that don't work out. I can hang on to them. And then if I work on it later and it works out, then I'll cradle it, frame it up. Good to go. But <clears throat> it doesn't take up as much space. You make your own frames as well, right? I do. Yeah, I make my own uh, natural wood floater frames. And so I have complete quality control over my whole project. <laughs> I mean, I'm making my panels, I'm making my frames, you know, so... When you buy a painting, typically, especially if it's on a panel, the whole thing was made from raw materials. You know, it was all made from raw materials. The the whole uh, and there's something satisfying about that too. You know, it's it's. I totally agree. Yeah, I love doing it. I love I like this part of it. I, you think about artists like Paul Clay and others that made their own frames for their art. Yeah, you know, it's it's a part of the the finished product. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. And the way mine, you know, came about, I don't know if the, if the listeners uh, are, you know, you can just look up uh, natural wood floater frames or whatever. It's a very contemporary way to frame a painting. And um, I went, I went to Monhegan Island in 2007 to paint with a, a friend of mine. We went back and, and um, in Maine, lots of art going on in Maine, that's for sure. And so I remember when we showed up, we were in the Rockland area um, before going off to uh, Monhegan Island. 
And I remember going into a gallery there and I just, there was so much good work up there. But I, there was a woman named Connie Hayes who had a show at the time and the paintings were framed in this, in these natural wood floaters. And I just thought, wow, look, that's, you know, I want to do that. I don't want to go with the, the plein air, typical plein air frame. I want to, the galleries that I was showing in are more contemporary galleries. And I wanted to have that, that kind of feel to my presentation. So when I got home, I looked up natural wood floaters and I was horrified at how expensive they were. And, uh, well, well, and thought, oftentimes well, they're, they're made out of polystyrene and, and made to look like wood. You know, it's not the real thing a lot of times. And those are expensive. Oh, yeah. yeah. Yes. Yeah. Right. If you wanted real wood ones, you know, you, which were typically, I think maple, some kind of light wood or whatever. Yep. I, yeah, the price, I was like, there's no way at my prices, you know, that I can, there's no way because, uh, artists, you know, the artist pays for the frame and brings a deliver, uh, delivers to the gallery, a framed, um, painting. So you've got, you know, that comes out of your pocket and then, you know, obviously then it goes on the wall and you split the, you split the sale 50, 50 with the gallery. So, you know, if you're spending a ton of money framing a show, like I can give an example, like my show, uh, if I've got 40 or 50 pieces in a show, I could easily spend $5,000 framing that show. And then that comes out of my pocket before the first sale even happens. So I've got to sell, we've got to sell $10,000 worth of paintings in that show for me to break even. And I was like, that just, no, that's not going to work. There's no way. So now I can frame a show. Um, it's a lot of work building it, but like you, I enjoy the process and the materials. I don't think they cost me $500, maybe $300 to frame a show like that. Right. And that includes that, that includes some big frames, some 36 by 36 is, but the nice thing is when you walk into the gallery, um, you know, I, I can't stress this enough. Presentation is so important. And I was really a stickler for that. Like I want when you to walk in the gallery, it there to be this sort of uniform, presentation all of the paintings are framed in the same way and there's there's just this uh it's kind of becomes your brand you know it's it's um so yeah so that's that's been a really helpful thing and to be honest with you without building my own frames i don't think i it would be really well, hard to do this for a living well, <laughs> especially especially in the beginning phase of what yeah. it would have been. well that's that's what i was doing this morning is making a natural wood floater frame for a, a painting that I was hoping would get exhibited, but I <laughs> coronavirus right, right. had other plans for me. So, <laughs> but I, hey, right. I went ahead and made the frame. You know, I'm going to frame it anyway. See what happens. Yes, yes. Uh, well, also too. Well, you, you know, you probably noticed like uh, there's a lot of people when I've done several videos where I talk about building natural wood floater frames, like sharing my process. And invariably, you know, everyone's like has suggestions. You know, they'll yeah. be like, "Oh, why don't you?" why don't you glue up, you know, why don't you glue up the sides and the bottom together first and then cut the section? Or why don't you paint the inside of the frame black first or paint all the wood? And uh, my only thing is I can't, you just have to do it. You, I can't even explain exactly, why these exactly. ideas don't work. So my point is, is that by going through the process, it's going to take a while before you figure out how to do it. And I've been building them now for 10 years and I'd say the last three years, I've pretty much, um, I don't, I don't have any, I haven't made any changes to what I do. It's I'm kind of settled on, um, on a method that I think is fast and uh, where it also like it works the first time. So I'm not like fussing around fixing things or whatever. Um, but it took a lot of, you know, building a lot of frames to get to that point. Um, and then I did share my process, you know, once I had settled into my final process that's been stable for three years now, I just shared that whole process in yeah, video form. I just found uh, how I make my floater frames 2019 edition. I should have yes. watched this before I made my floater <laughs> <laughs> this morning. <laughs> right, right, right. All right. Yeah. Well, it's well, never too late. You can watch it for your next batch. That's what I will do. In fact, uh, for, for the listeners, to the Artful Painter, I'm going to include these links, links to uh, Mike's uh, YouTube channel. It is fantastic. I, it's a source of inspiration. I really enjoy it. I, I clearly have not listened, watched all, all the, the videos, but uh, uh, I'll get around to it eventually. It's it's uh, very inspiring. In fact, that's oh, okay. uh, speaking, speaking about the benefits, we were talking about this a while back about uh, community and 
YouTube and all these different things. That's exactly why you and I are together today. You know, I responded to a, a comment and you responded. And the next thing you know, here we are, we're talking. And That's right. what, what a beautiful thing that is to be able to do that. So I really appreciate you taking the time to be a part of the Artful Painter. Oh, it's been a pleasure. Bro. I appreciate it. Yeah. Yeah. You can tell, you can probably tell I can talk about this stuff all day. <laughs> but yeah, no, I really enjoyed talking to you. It's been great. Yeah, me too. This has been fun. I hope you enjoyed this conversation with Michael Chamberlain. I know when we were recording this, there were some things that uh, really stood out in my mind about him. He was very approachable, very easy to talk to. He, his humility and his candor really stood out to me. I also appreciated his willingness to share some of the lessons that he has learned as he continues to learn uh, about painting and becoming a better painter. In fact, one of the big takeaways here I thought was very profound was where Michael says the difference between a good painter and a great painter is the ability to say, I'm going to figure this out and I'm going to be tenacious about solving these problems. That is a fantastic lesson, one that is worthy of setting as a goal for all of us to become better painters. If you want to find out more about Michael, the best thing to do is go check out his YouTube video. He has a bunch of videos out there. They cover his plein air painting sessions, uh, many of his fine DIY projects that are very affordable and on budget. So it's, it's a very enjoyable channel. The way you find it is to do a search on YouTube for Chamberlain Paintings. That's C-H-A-M-B-E-R-L-A-I-N Paintings, all one word. I will provide a link in the show notes and the blog post for this episode. I'd like to take a moment to acknowledge some of the listeners who have taken the time to provide feedback to the show. For example, Colin from the UK says, I just wanted to say thank you for such a great podcast. I have only been painting around a month or two, completely bewildered by the overload of information on the web. I then stumbled onto your podcast, which has not only given me new inspiration with every episode, but also providing me with good groundworks on the knowledge needed when learning to paint. At a time when I'm stuck at my desk or inside my house, your podcast is an immense salvation to my mental well-being. So kudos, dude, and keep up the great work. Hey, thanks, Colin. I appreciate that. I think it's very cool that you've just started learning how to paint, but I get it. I understand that overwhelm. There's so much information out there, and it can be difficult to wade through it, but I appreciate you taking the time to listen to this podcast. And indeed, it's the guests on this show that provide the groundwork or the knowledge that you need and the inspiration that you you need when learning to paint. So thank you. For, thank you for letting me know that. I wish you the best there in the UK as you begin to learn how to paint. Also got this note from Tony. So excited to hear this. Carl, I love your podcast. You do a great job. Now, this is in response. I send out an email newsletter each time an episode is released. And there's a PS in that newsletter email. That email actually comes straight to me and I encourage you to reply to it. It's okay. I, re I, I read every email message that comes in. So that's why uh, this is this particular comment is in response to the email campaign that I sent out in connection with the episode that featured George Van Hook. So that's why I just wanted to give some context there. But anyway, I appreciated that that feedback from Tony. Thank you very much. Now, here's another one. This is another message that came in as a reply to the email newsletter. This is from Ryan. Hi, Carl. Just replying to your PS to wish you well in the quarantine. We are in Hampton, Georgia, isolating. But with three kids, six and under, it's been a long few weeks already. Thanks for keeping the podcast going. I'll give this one a listen later today. And what he's talking about is the episode with George Van Hook. Thank you, Ryan. I appreciate that. So anyway, I love hearing from everyone. To send me a note, go to my website at carlolson.tv and click the contact tab. You can send me a message there. You can connect with me on social media. You can also do a reply to the email newsletter that comes out with each edition of this podcast. Thank you for listening to The Artful Painter. I'll see you in the next episode.
Mr. on the TV. 